dearly at influence, storytelling techniques, and values. We can see here Troy near Istanbul. The Iliad, the story, is based on a war that's believed to have occurred in 1300 BC. Back then, when the Iliad was being written, there was no distinction made between history and fiction. If you told a story, you were telling a story that was believed to be loosely on, on truth, although they added fantastical elements to that story. 600 years later, Homer writes the Iliad. And it was often thought by historians that the location of Troy was that bright dot there, not far from Istanbul. But it wasn't until the late 1800s when an architect and uh, an archaeologist called Hendrik Schliemann discovered ruins and a fortress in that location and putting two and two together. It's now believed by most that that is the location of Troy and that there was a real battle fought around 1300 BC. A little bit later, Homer writes the Odyssey. These two stories are two halves of the same story. The Iliad is a 10 year war where the, the Greeks are besieging Troy. And then the, the Odyssey is a 10 year return home. The Greeks have been victorious, but Odysseus spends 10 years trying to get back to his family. So the first is more of a group quest and the second is more of an individual quest. Then we've got Aristotle writing his poetics about 300 years later. And in that he's talking about how to write a good story, um, how to write a good poem. And he's leaning heavily on how Homer wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. He was the tutor to Alexander the Great, personal tutor, pretty cool personal tutor. <laughs> yeah, it's like, who's a personal tutor? Alexander, Alexander who? <laughs> Alexander the Great, obviously. And he recommended to Alexander that he should read the Iliad. So Alexander had it as his bedside book when he went fighting his campaigns. And he always wanted to be the next Achilles, who was one of the protagonists in the Iliad. Fast forward a bit further, we've got the Aeneid written by Virgil. Now that was written in Latin, whereas the Iliad was written in Greek. And the Aeneid is about the character Aeneas, who's in the Iliad, and he is going to set up Rome, which is more of a story aligned with Virgil, who was a Roman. Fast forward a bit further, we've got Dante's Divine Comedy in 1320. Now, Dante's Divine Comedy is thought to be one of the foundational texts of the um, uh, Renaissance period partly because he chose to write, write in his local dialect rather than Latin. And then that started a movement and everyone wrote in their lo local dialect. And in that, in the, in the Divine Comedy, the key character goes down into, into hell, into the inferno, with a copy of the Aeneas. You can see this story is still continuing. Fast forward to James Joyce with Ulysses. And Ulysses is a translation of the word Odysseus but one is Latin and the other is Greek. So we've got these phenomenal artists and poets who are all responding to what the previous person has said over a long, long history. James Joyce's Ulysses, T.S. Eliot said that it's the best book ever, best, best modern book ever written. And out of this great literature is born in part the, the Western tradition. So an understanding of, of and, it, and it reflects the way that people have thought throughout time, an understanding of, of the Iliad, especially when put next to the way that we see the world, helps us to understand where we've come from and who we are today and potentially where we might be going tomorrow. Moving on to storytelling techniques. This is one of the points that Aristotle makes in his poetics right at the start. He says it's a 10 year war, but there's, only, there's a focus on just one section, which is right at the end. It doesn't bother with all of the details. It's just a, a key point, a bit like you know, a tennis match where there's points that define the destiny of the tournament. It was oral storytelling with set structures. It's remarkable to think that this 500 page book was memorized and then told in an audience over several days. I mean, fortunately, there wouldn't have been so many books to remember by then, which would have made it easier, but I do find that do you find that fairly remarkable? 
it's made easier by the fact that there were set structures for how you would tell the story. So here we've got X happens, like Y, when Y does X, that is how X happens. I've taken a passage here that helps elucidate that structure. So we've got one, hideous groans went up from men being hacked to death by his sword, and the water was reddened with their blood. Two, as fish dart away in terror before a huge dolphin and crowd into the corners of the shelves of cove. Three, where it consume, consumes whatever it catches. Four, so the Trojans cowered under the overhanging banks of that terrible river. And I imagine that once you've remembered one, you can battle your way through to four. It's a neat way to remember 500 pages of a book. Summary of the story, and this isn't a spoiler alert, because when this story was written, everyone knew the story. There were, there were new stories weren't written. They were always based on things that everyone already knew. So I'm not spoiling anything. And there are two layers to the realities. There's the mortals and there's the gods. So starting first with the mortals, Paris, a Trojan, is invited to dinner by Menelaus, who's a Greek. Paris sleeps with Menelaus's wife, Helen. Imagine Menelaus is not best pleased. <laughs> So he goes to speak with Lord Agamemnon, his brother, and Agamemnon and he take the Greeks to war, a 10-year war to bring her back. Ultimately, the Greeks win. There's a simple message here that is, if you get invited to dinner and go home with your host wife, it will probably bring ruin not only to yourself, but to your entire family and culture. But there are also other messages that are, are deeper and more subtle, but that's an obvious one on the surface that I think is worth mentioning. <laughs> then the second layer we've got is, is the gods. And this story isn't mentioned in the Iliad. It's, it's, it's alluded to, but it's not set out straight like I'm about to now. It's assumed that you knew this story. So Paris is asked to choose who is the fairest goddess. And the reason why he's asked that is that the gods are having a, a wedding and the goddess of strife hasn't been invited. Ah, she's pretty irate. So she throws a golden apple into the wedding, and on that apple it says, to the fairest. Three goddesses step forward, claiming to be the fairest. One is Zeus's wife, Hera, and then two are his daughters, Athena, the goddess of wisdom, and Aphrodite, the goddess of love. They go up to Zeus and they say, Zeus, you've got to choose between the three of us. And Zeus says, absolutely not. And that's a marriage nightmare, and it's also going you know, to cause a bit of a difficulty between me and my daughters. But I know just the man for the job, and he passes it on to Paris, a mortal. And the three goddesses go up to Paris, and they each offer him a sweetener as he's making his decision. Hera, Zeus's wife, says, I'll give you power. Uh, you can be la lord of all of the land. Athena, the goddess of wisdom, says, I will give you success in battle and ability with your sword and it's okay that's not so bad and then and then aphrodite offers him the love of the most beautiful woman in the world and paris does he weighs them up and he decides to go for love of the most beautiful woman in the world he chooses aphrodite by choosing aphrodite he is offered helen who's deemed to be the most beautiful woman in the world who is married already to menelaus and there we see this interaction between the two worlds and it's interesting to know that the mortal world doesn't from a storytelling perspective you can tell the story without the the gods but you can't tell the story of the gods without the mortals but there's there's something in there the gods appear throughout the story disguised as mortals in most instances so we see here they took his hands adopting human form and the gods interplay with the mortals and take sides so the gods breathe daring into into his heart and always when you see people being roused up there's an assumption that there's a god playing here so i like this one ajax at full stretch slipped because athena had put him out of action i mean nowadays if someone slips it's because they they just lost grip on their shoes but you can imagine the greeks with their imagination if Usain Bolt slips, it's like, oh, Athena's jealous because she thinks he might be faster than, you know, Hermes is jealous because he thinks he might be faster than he is. So he slipped him up. And it, it's very playful, and I, I, I love it. 
And then finally, he'd forgotten to promise Lord Apollo an impressive offering and missed the bird. Again, if we missed the bird today, say, well, you, you know, you stayed up too late last night or you didn't focus in the moment. But the Greek imagination is, oh, well, he should have paid more heed and respect to the powers that be, and he's paying a price for it now. Some of the values now that, that shine through in the book. First of all, limitation, the importance of an appreciation of, of one's limits. So Hector is the best Trojan, but Achilles is a better man who's a Greek. So even as the best of his kind, he knows that there's someone better. And then Achilles, who is known to be the best man, has, is, a proud, is a proud man, and his pride ultimately brings about the death of his best friend Patroclus. He refuses to fight over a squabble with Lord Agamemnon and his friend Patroclus, who wants to support the, the rest of the army, says, can I wear your armor and I will go out and fight? And, and, and Achilles says, yeah, okay, you can wear my armor. And Patroclus is then slain by Hector. And ultimately that brings Achilles back into fight. And when he's brought back into fight, he's given a choice. He knows that if he goes to fight for the for the Greeks, he will die in that fight. Again, it's, it's always, you always have a premonition in these, these stories. It's not as uncertain about what's going to happen. He knew that that choice was to be made, and it was his to be made. And alternatively, he could have life and longevity. They didn't have the, they had an underworld, but it wasn't a place you wanted to go to. It wasn't that heaven with a time of bliss. So when you died, you didn't get rewarded in heaven. You had a, a pretty torrid time. So it really was, life is limited, life is valuable. What do I, what does Achilles want to choose? He chooses glory. And throughout the, the Iliad and Greek society, glory was, was key. Next, rhetoric. We've got three different types of rhetoric here. We've got ethos, which is an appeal to ethics, pathos, an appeal to passion, and logos, which is an appeal to logic. And this is another point that's mentioned by Aristotle in his Poetics. And he's mentioning, he's analyzing Homer's Iliad, saying we can clearly see there are these three distinctive types of rhetoric that are used by the characters. And you still see it now, today. It's, it's worth reflecting on because you can see how what people are using when they're persuading you to do one thing or another. And it's necessary in all walks of life. So for instance, if you are a doctor, you need to be able to persuade your patient that you know what you're talking about and that your diagnosis is correct because you're going to give advice that they need to act upon. So if you were to, to use these three methods, first of all, ethics, which is an appeal to, it, in our, we, we think it's just appeal to being a good person and it is partly that, but it's really about being the right person. It's like status, it's like your accolades. So you go in and you say, but not only my doctor, I'm also a knee specialist. I've seen thousands of knees like this someone's got a bad knee and you're thinking well I've got a bad knee they've seen thousands of knees and they're a knee specialist yeah, I'm probably in the right place then you appeal to pathos and a pathos pathos in today's language is more like an appeal to emotion it's a showing of of understanding and you can say oh my 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 cousin had a really bad knee and said how difficult it was facing the idea that she wouldn't be able to run on a regular basis because that's what she usually does and you get that sense that there's a human understanding there that's a, using pity but you could also use humor you know you could say oh you've lost your knee but at least you haven't lost your leg you know which which might not go down so well but play that you've got to know the audience <laughs> and then finally you can appeal to to logos to logic and this was revered particularly by by the greeks although it wasn't always the 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 appeal that had the ultimate sway but if we look at the knee situation there's a famous syllogism, which is Socrates, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. There's a clear logical structure to that. And you can apply that same structure to diagnosing a knee. You can say all people who, when standing on one leg with a bad knee and turning from the right to the left, feel the pain on the right hand side, have damaged ligaments. 
why don't you try doing that? They try doing it, they have that exact same pain, and you go, well, therefore, you must have that precise problem as well. So you've used all three methods there, and hopefully the, the patient is believing that you've given them a correct diagnosis. But what that story has also shown is that you can appeal to all three of these with good rhetoric and still be talking nonsense. Now, I, I have not got lots of I do not know loads of people. I'm not a doctor. And I haven't got a cousin who's had a bad knee. And I've got no idea about how to judge whether or not it's a, a, a crucial ligament or whatever thing I came up with in that moment. And it, it just shows that you have to be really careful because people who have good rhetoric often disguise the fact that they don't speak truth. Now we're just talking a bit about, I'm angry to fight and no words of yours will put me off. And another one, I could fight with gods with words, but with a spear it is more difficult. Hector, this is a nod to the idea of what's more powerful, the, the sword or the pen. And throughout this book, you get the feeling like there's very little distinction made between word and action. You know, when someone decides to do something, it's because they've been persuaded by someone else to do it. So there's very little distinction. But here you can see that ultimately the sword is the most powerful and it will conquer the word, which is partly why Zeus is the most powerful god, even though Athena, his daughter, is the most persuasive and the most wise. He is the strongest. Achilles is the best man. Agamemnon is the most powerful. This is looking at some enduring debates that were alluded to in this book and are still spoken about now. We've got merit and status. Which one is more important? They were arguing and Achilles was proud to say, well, I'm the best fighter in the army. And Agamemnon saying, well, you know, I'm the Lord, you should be listening to me. And I'm sure that this same struggle will be for Solskjaer now that he's got Ronaldo as the best player in his team. Aeneas picked up a rock. Not even two men could do it today. Here we're looking at a prize past. Throughout the novel, you hear individuals who existed before spoken about as being better than men who exist today. And this is different, I would say, to how we tend to see things um, in the current climate, which is more that we're constantly evolving and improving on what we were before. Um, but they were they have held the past, both the culture and the individuals with more reverence. An innocent man should not suffer for another's troubles. Aeneas, this is touching on interventionist policy. Both sides believe in the same gods. Here we've got religion is not the cause of war. I find this one really interesting because quite often you hear religion cited as a cause of war and that's why we shouldn't have religion. But in this book, it's quite clear that the cause of war is the fact that Helen was taken by Paris. They both believe in the same gods and they both value the same beauty. Sometimes inside a household there can be a debate because one person wants a wooden floor in their kitchen and the other person wants a tiled floor. But in this instance, there's an agreement that, that they both find Helen the most beautiful. So there's also an allusion there to, to um, uh, beauty being uh, more objective than subjective. Priam wept aloud for man slaying Hector all the way through the book. I mean, Priam is king of of Troy, and he's crying. I mean, admittedly, a lot of his sons get killed, but he's crying all the way through the book. You know, men had very, very emotion, very open emotions back then. It is judgment rather than muscle that, that makes the best woodcutter. Here, they're looking at strength and wisdom. A, a descendant of Zeus is better than the son of a river, Achilles. I wanted to mention this one because I think it's fairly contentious. And I can imagine some people taking umbrage with Homer because of this. It's quite clear throughout that aristocratic preference runs through the novel. And whether that's, it might be that, that was Homer's prefer preference, it might be all of the Greeks, it might be because the primary audience when people were speaking, reading the poetry back then was aristocratic. Anyway, I end on, on that one in terms of the values. Now I'm going to look at a little bit of the philosophy that I find most interesting in this book. So first of all, on the left, we've got resourceful Odysseus, swift-footed Achilles. What that's saying is that Odysseus is fundamentally resourceful. He's born resourceful. He's always going to be resourceful. And Achilles is always going to be swift-footed. 
So their essence comes before they're born. They, that, that's who they are. But let's compare that to Simone de Beauvoir's incredibly powerful statement. One is not born, but becomes a woman, which is in her second sex, one of the foundational texts of feminist literature. What she's saying there is, no, Odysseus, you don't have to be resourceful. You can be whatever you want because you're not born a man, but you become a man and you have freedom. So there's a very, very different take here on what it means to being a human being. And one says that essence precedes existence. And that is fundamentally essentialism. And the other one, to coin John Paul Sartre's phrase, is that existence precedes essence, which is existentialism. John Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir were in a romantic relationship. It can only be described as complicated, but they did last the distance. They buried one, one above the other. And it's only right to mention that although they popularized these phrases, they themselves went to Germany and studied the phenomenologists, Edmund Husserl, Martin Heidegger, and through that they then discovered these, these phrases that are, that are readier to, to grasp than some of those of the uh, philosophers I just mentioned. A note on, on what this means, whether you lean towards essentialism and existentialism, it's, it's clear with essentialism that you're less free. If what you are precedes your coming into being, you're bound by that. Whereas with existentialism, with you're more free, which I absolutely love, it's why I, I got rather hooked on it. You know, the track onto which you're born is not the track you have to stay on. You can go off and pursue another destiny. But the trouble with it, which is why I think it's really important to also hold at the same time as an appreciation of some of the essential aspects of, of your character and being, is the, is, the, is the anxiety that comes with the freedom. You know, yes, there are tracks that you can get onto that aren't the ones that you're expected to be on, but with total freedom, you're probably going to be a little bit disappointed with the track that you end up on, because it's not quite as good as the one that you were dreaming for, because essentially you are bound by some things. Is what the Greeks would say, and also what I say. <laughs> fate and, and destiny. So fate, he met his fate. Destiny, she pursued her destiny. What I'm trying to get at here is the idea that these two concepts are not the same. We use them interchangeably. And actually, at the beginning of this talk, I said destiny when I should have said fate, because it, they really do get used the whole time. But they are different. If we swap these words and we say he pursued his fate, you think that doesn't sound quite right. Or she met her destiny. That doesn't feel quite right. And it's because fate is something that we have. We don't have freedom over. It happens to us and it's usually a negative thing, whereas destiny is where we have our free will. And the Greeks are very clear about this and they they link it to good and evil. Ultimately, you can't, you can't control your fate, but you can control your destiny. And if you make a decision within the realm of freedom that is bad, you will then be, in their view, punished by the gods. And the gods themselves are, and the sentence here is, 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 sums it up, that good and bad sit above the gods, who are the guardians of right and wrong. And what I'm trying to get at here is partly a response to a lecture I watched recently, or it was a debate between Peter Hitchens and Christopher Hitchens, debating uh, religion and whether or not it's a good thing. And Christopher, their brothers, incredibly brave, they stood up and, and did that debate and we're all better off for it. Christopher stands up and he says, can you guys all think of a single good thing that a religious person can do, but a non-religious person can't do. Similarly, can you think of a single bad thing that a religious person would do that a non-religious person wouldn't do? Once he said that, you can tell he feels like he's, he's won the argument. But if the Greeks were to hear that, they would say, well, you've won your argument. But the structure of that debate is based on the idea that what God says is good because it's what he says but that's not the way the greeks see it they see good and evil as sitting above the gods who are the guardians of right and wrong and i was trying to come up with a way of explaining it and i thought of like an ant that's come into your kitchen sure everyone's had it and you see the ant and you're thinking 
I'm not quite sure what to do this then. Shall I, you know, I need to protect the food. Shall I, shall I stamp on the ant? Shall I guide the ant, ant outside? He's being, you know, pretty brave. Sure, he's hungry, trying to feed his family. But if I let him in, he's probably going to bring his whole, all of his friends back. And if he brings all of his friends, then what's right will change. Because if there's thousands of ants, it's then a war. The ants have to be destroyed if they're in the kitchen. It's a nightmare. You can't be funneling one ant at a time. But if there's just one ant, you might decide, as a guardian of the kitchen, just to put your foot down in the ant's path, not on the ant. And then the ant, the ant is pursuing her destiny, the food that's on the kitchen counter. But she's met her fate, which is the shoe that's directly in front of her. And she's got no choice over, over the shoe. She then has to make a decision. Is she going to turn around and go back? Is she going to wait, wait it out? Is she going to go round? And and that's that guardian idea is is it's how the Greeks saw the idea of the gods that they would they would bring fate into play to help move our destinies and and guide us. And if we were doing something like taking someone else's food from their kitchen. We might put the foot in the way and say, that's not your food. You need to go in an opposite direction. And the question is, I mean, I felt it myself personally, the, the foot being put down. You know, I've made a, I've stepped wrong and, and you, you know, you feel like you get, you get punished. You, know, you get caught in a caterpillar boot or maybe even caterpillar tracks. And it's, and it's, it's not pleasant. And we've had an enormous shoe come down on us collectively over the last year where what we were planning to do are, original destinies have been changed by the life that we've had to face. And the question that remains is, are these shoes coming down at random, born out of chance, or are they coming down with a conscience that might be benevolent, a spirit that's that's alive, a being, a force, a guardian, whatever you want to call it, for the Greeks, the answer was simple. It was quite clear that the gods were playing a part and that the gods, the god, makes havoc with the schemes of men.